to go live in about 15 seconds. Hello and good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Pastoral City Council for Tuesday, November the 3rd. We're happy to have you with us here tonight. Before we call the meeting to order, let me read the following. In compliance with the state and county shelter at home orders and as allowed by the governor's executive order N-29-20, which allows for a deviation of teleconference rules required by the Ralph M. Brown Act, city council meetings will be held by teleconference only until further notice. Rather than attending in person, residents should call 805-865-7276 to provide public comment via telephone. The phone line will be open just prior to the start of the closed session meeting and again prior to the start of the regular meeting. Written public comments can be submitted via email to cityclerk at prcity.com prior to 12 noon on the day of the council meeting to be posted as an addendum to the agenda. If submitting written comments in advance of the meeting, please note the agenda item by number or name. City Council meetings will be live streamed during the meeting, also available to play later on YouTube by accessing the following link, www.prcity.com forward slash YouTube. All of that being said, we are having some technical challenges tonight. Our internet service provider is reporting some uh, isolated outages. So we want to remind the people listening right now, if there is an interruption in the internet service, they may still hear the uh, city council meeting on our local radio station, KPRL AM 1230. And once again, the phone number to call for public comment is 805-865-7276. And with that, I will call the meeting to order, invite everyone to mute their microphones with the exception of Councilman John Hammond and ask him to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Joe, may please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. For our meditation to open tonight, we have Mr. Dan Feldman. Mr. Feldman, are you with us? Mayor Martin, Mr. Feldman has not called in to do the invocation. Very good. We appreciate his offer to participate with that. He is not online right now. So he, uh, when he does call in, if he wants to make comment during general public comment, that would be fine. But we're going to go ahead and move ahead with our meeting. Can we please have a roll call? Council Member Garcia? Here. Council Member Gregory? Here. Council Member Hammond? Here. Council Member Strong? Here. Mayor Martin? And I am present. At this time, we set aside a few minutes for staff introductions. So if we could go around the virtual room here and have our staff members online introduce themselves to the public, that would be appreciated. Warren Frace, Community Development Director. Christopher Leckel, Interim Public Works Director. Julie Dolan, Community Services Director, joined by Frida Berman, Maintenance Superintendent. Ty Lewis, Police Chief. Jonathan Stornetta, Fire Chief. Ryan Cornell, Administrative Services. Sarah Johnson Rios, Assistant City Manager, joined by Dave McHugh, IT Manager, Paul Sloan, Economic Development Manager, Shauna Howenstein, Civic Engagement Coordinator. And I would like to introduce uh, Melissa Martin as the city's first official appointed city clerk. She was appointed this morning into this role that the voters um, changed from an elected city clerk to an appointed city clerk in 2018. So uh, with Dennis Fensler's retirement a couple of months ago, Melissa has been acting as the city's uh, acting city clerk and we're very happy to appoint her as the city's new permanent city clerk. Uh, congratulations, Melissa. Uh, Kimberly Hood, interim city attorney. Tom Fritchie, city manager. Thank you all. Prior to this uh, regular open session of the Pastoral City Council, we had an announced closed session of the city council. At this time, I'll ask the city attorney if there was any reportable action from that meeting. 
Uh, the council convened in closed session for a conference with real property negotiators as identified on the agenda regarding 4301 Second Wind Way. There is no reportable action. Thank you very much. We move on now with our regular agenda. Presentations are first. Item number one is our COVID-19 community update. Mr. Stornetta. Good evening, Mayor Martin, members of the council. This I'll wait for our slide pull up here. Okay, next slide. And next slide, please. Thank you. The state now has over 934,000 positive cases, which is an increase of approximately 60,000 new cases since the last report to the council. Total deaths in the state have risen to 17,686, an increase of 694 new deaths since our last report. Next slide, please. The Paso Robles region continues to lead the county in total case counts. The largest number of cases by age continues to be those between 18 and 29 years old. San Luis Obispo County total cases are at 4,380 with 33 fatalities and 202 active cases. Currently, eight are in the hospital and two of those being in the ICU. Next slide, please. San Luis Obispo County remains in tier two, which is red and will remain in this tier through November 10th. No updates to tier assignments will be made by the state until November 4th due to election day. Next slide, please. And that concludes the situa situational status update for COVID-19. I'll now turn it over to our assistant city manager, Ms. Johnson Rios for a city response update. Thank you, Chief Starnetta. So on the communication side, um, I think we're a couple slides down, please, Mr. Frace. Um, you may have seen since the last council meeting, a new banner that went up in the library city hall parking lot and, and pole banners uh, in the park. There will be a similar banner going up on Pumpkin Hill at the corner of Crescent and River Roads and matching pole banners to go up on the 13th Street Bridge soon. A big thank you to the locally owned primarily promotions company for donating uh, the Pumpkin Hill and 13th Street Bridge banners. Next slide, please. City staff has been instrumental in assisting the county's joint incident command in identifying farm labor contractors throughout Slow County and distributing COVID prevention kits and in-person education. Over 1,600 kits have been distributed, including at farms, ranches, and vineyards in the Paso Robles area. In-person education focuses on COVID prevention practices and is delivered in English, Spanish, and Mixteco. The teams that are speaking with the farm laborers are reporting that in addition to COVID impacts, their greatest concerns um, other than finances have to do with their children, primarily help with children's schoolwork, um, childcare, and finding opportunities for physical activity for kids. So the Farm Labor Task Force is working on these issues now, and Shauna Howenstein uh, from city staff is, is representing the city in these efforts. So thank you, Shauna. Uh, wanna remind the public that a mask drive is underway um, next slide, please. Sorry. A mask drive is underway. And here locally, Birch Fabrics, um, which is a Paso Robles company, has donated 2,000 pre cut mask kits to the county mask drive. Half of those are available for pickup at the Paso Robles Library, the other half are available uh, in Atascadero City Hall. And residents can complete those masks if we have any residents with sewing skills and then drop them off in the, in the lobby of the police department at 900 Park Street um, for the county to collect. Next slide, please. Just a, a reminder, Recreation Services is offering a wide variety of outdoor and indoor classes at Centennial Park, all following state and county guidelines for distancing and occupancy. A lot of the classes are filling up and the most popular ones recently have been youth basketball, acrylic painting for all ages, dog training, karate, and gloga, which is glow in the dark yoga. I had a chance to participate in that and it was great. So. Um, I think we have one more slide on um, next slide, please. Recreation um, opportunities, which are also being provided by contract instructors and um, all information, all class information can be found at prcity.com backslash recreation online. So just wanted to make sure residents are aware that these 
opportunities are available. Many of them are outdoors. Some of them are virtual opportunities um, for you to take advantage of. Next slide, please. And as we move toward the holiday season, we wanted to make folks aware that the state is actually developing guidelines for safe ways to celebrate the holidays. So um, there are some concerns that with colder weather and surging cases and hospitalizations around the country coinciding the flu season, uh, the holiday season and holiday gatherings are, are going to be risky this year. So we will be continuing to provide updates on ways to safely celebrate the holidays. Next slide, please. And a big part of the county's messaging um, that we want to pass along is really focusing on pandemic fatigue. So and we've been in this for a while. We just want to continue to remind people of the resources that are available. Uh, we have the Be Well Paso information on the city's website, a lot of library resources um, for entertainment and interaction opportunities, the rec classes that we mentioned. Um, and then there are also state and county resources. So there's a COVID warm line to call if stress is, is significant significantly impacting people that provides free non-emergency support and referrals to California residents. Um, and then in addition, the slow hotline is a confidential, confidential mental health support crisis and suicide prevention telephone line. Uh, and that number again is 800-783-0607 for anyone listening who uh, wants to take advantage of those resources. Next slide, please. And lastly, just a reminder that we do have free um, testing available Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at the event center from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Paso Robles is the only city in the county with a Saturday testing site, which provides flexibility um, for folks who have traditional uh, business working hours. And so um, take advantage of that. That is one of the ways that we are staying in the red tiers because of the bonus that the state gives counties for conducting high numbers of tests. So that concludes tonight's presentation and we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. This is a presentation and no action is required. Uh, council comments or questions? Councilman Gregory? Yes, uh, Chief Starnett, I just had a question for you on our Sir, our current circumstance. I understand that we're getting towards the bottom in our numbers on the the current color code we're in for regulations, and that may change. We may drop into the next period. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sir. So currently, our case rate, adjusted case rate per hundred thousand, and what the adjusted case rate means is just like Miss Johnson Rios talked about the number of tests that are conducted in the county adjust our overall rate. So currently we're at four and that's a four case rate per 100,000. And if we remain under that four for two consecutive weeks, we move to tier three. And when we go down to our positivity rate, we need to keep that below 5% and currently we're at 2%. And then as far as our health uh, equity index, we are within range on that to move to the next tier as well. So we do need to remain under that uh, cases per rate of 100,000 of less than four for two consecutive weeks to move into tier three. And hopefully we'll get some news from the state tomorrow when they update the, the blueprint for a safer economy, our results for tomorrow and have more information for you. And, uh, we do have a, a tricky time coming up because part of our a benefit has been in the additional testing that Cal Poly students have been undertaking and that helps us. But uh, over the holidays, of course, that testing won't take place. And so that is um, a little bit um, worrisome for our overall tier status. So I had one more question and what is that the moderate level? What has that allowed us to do, Chief Starnetta? Did you hear that? Yes, sir. Sorry about that. You know what? I don't have that directly in front of me. Okay. Sarah, do you know that off the top of your? Um, I can pull it up if we have other questions and give more detail, but it, it basically it allows um, various business types to operate at a little bit higher occupancy. So for example, in the red tier where we are now, restaurants are able to have 25% occupancy indoors and that percentage goes up somewhat in the orange tier. I believe the orange tier also um, allows uh, tasting rooms to start limited occupancy indoor tastings, for example, and there are a number of other industries that would have um, 
that that would have permissions that they don't currently have in the red tier. All right. Well, um, is there easy access to see what those um, changes could be? Is there a website I can go to? Uh, relatively easy. It's at covid19.ca.gov, and then there are um, there are a couple of clicks on that page to get to the the actual table. It's a it's a PDF document. That's a table. Um, I believe it's also linked from the city website. But the most direct way to get there is via covid19.ca.gov. Great. Thank you. I can copy all of you through email with that chart. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Councilman Hammond. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The only question I really had, and I've had it for quite a while, is you know, our zip code that shows uh, our high numbers of uh, positivity is uh, not just in Paso Robles. I would really, it'd be nice to have a map overlay of what indeed that zip code covers. In other words, people are always pointing a finger at Paso for the fact that we have so many. Truly, you know, we know it's out in the county as well. So it'd be nice to, I don't know if there's a graphic for that, uh, Jonathan, or, you know, anything like that that kind of shows the public really what that zip code or what those numbers are really including physically as far as the county. Councilman Hammer and I do have a map. I don't have it readily available, but I can email that to all of you as well. And I will also add that we have reached out to the Public Health Department on numerous occasions asking for further details on whether these cases are within the city or the county to better our approach and hopefully decrease in the numbers and helping with our messaging, but uh, they have been reluctant to do so. Yeah, I wonder why. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Councilman Strong. Uh, yes, I, I was wondering I'm on uh, all of this outreach that we're doing. Is that federal and state money or is there local money involved? And if so, who's doing the funding? In terms of the community outreach, Councilmember Strong? Yes. Um, yes, community outreach and the, the, all of the masks and, and the education, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a, it's a variety of funding sources, and um, and I would ask uh, Shauna Howenstein if she's available to provide any more specifics to please jump in. But but the county is leading our local um, outreach efforts. They're working with various partners, including Dignity Health and others. Um, and then the city has used um, on the city side CARES Act funding to uh, complete our COVID-19 communications efforts. So um, the PPE kits, um, I understand a lot of those have been donated. The mask um, drive, for example, uh, Birch Fabrics donated the 2000 kits that are being produced here locally. So it's a combination of county funding, um, city funding via the CARES Act, and then private contributions as well. No, because that's wonderful. I was asking because I know there's a lot of our citizens who are very concerned about our budget and uh, whether we're impacting our budget unnecessarily in any way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman Garcia. No, sir, no questions. Thank you. Very good. This is a presentation item. I would ask staff to let me know if we have anybody from the community who wants to make a comment. No, sir. Very good. We'll move on to the next item. Uh, did I hear a comment from Council? Mayor Martin, this was Chief Stormetta. I was just yes, going to add some quick highlights on the Please. business tiers, if you wanted to hear that real quick. Sure, go ahead. Okay, some of the biggest changes we would see, and I'm not going to go through all these, there's a long list, but one of them's retail would go from 50% capacity to open with just modifications. Additionally, shopping centers currently at 50% capacity, it would go to open indoors with modifications, museums, zoos, aquariums, 25% to 50%. Places of worship would increase to 50%. Theaters would increase to 50%. And then some increases in uh, hotels, lodging, uh, gyms and fitness centers. And lastly, restaurants would be from 25% capacity or 100 people to 50% capacity or 200 people. So those are just some highlights and I'll, I'll email this to the council members. Very good. Thank you for that additional information. 
Moving on now, number uh, two on our agenda under presentations, we have law enforcement records and support personnel day proclamation. I understand our police chief is standing by to receive this. Yes, sir, I am. Very good. Law enforcement records and support personnel day, November 10th, 2020. Whereas, Passable's police department and all law enforcement agencies throughout the state depend upon law enforcement records and support personnel to provide them with vital services. And whereas the Passables Police Department Records Bureau and support personnel are crucial to helping law enforcement agencies identify, pursue, capture, and process suspected lawbreakers. And whereas the professionals continually use their expertise and experience to assist in tracking felons, maintaining criminal statistics, and improving apprehension strategies, and whereas the Passables Police Department Records Bureau staff entered thousands of documents into the records management system, processed multiple subpoenas as court liaison, and provided live scan services to hundreds of citizens, and whereas it is important to recognize California's law enforcement records and support personnel for their valuable contributions to our law enforcement system, and whereas the State Executive Board of the California Law Enforcement Association of Records Supervisors has proclaimed November 10th, 2020, as Law Enforcement Records and Support Personnel Day. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Stephen W. Martin, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor and speaking on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby proclaim November 10th, 2020, as Law Enforcement Records and Support Personnel Day in the city of Paso Robles and extend our gratitude to the Paso Robles Police Department Records Bureau staff and support personnel for their dedicated service to our community their diligence, and their commitment to keeping our city and citizens safe. Mr. Lewis? I am here. Sorry about that. I just want to take a moment to uh, thank our records clerks, as you've done, Mr. Mayor. I think that uh, our uh, record supervisor, Mary Sponholtz, um, has done a great job. Uh, we handle a lot of calls here in the police department. Um, over 2,500 police reports so far to date, um, thousands of uh, citations issued. Every piece of paperwork basically that the police department produces goes through either Sandra High School, Kate Berry, or Denise Cameron, or Andrea Fletis's fingertips here at the police department. And I want to personally thank them for the hard work that they do. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do our jobs, uh, interface with the various police departments and sheriff's department and the DA's office here in the county if it wasn't for them. They're an integral part of our team that helps keep our community safe. So I extend my personal thank you for their hard work and I thank the council for recognizing them this evening. Thank you and once again thank them for all the efforts they make on our behalf. We appreciate it. Item number three is a proclamation for National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. And I understand we have the Executive Director of Hospice, Shannon, and forgive me if this is a mispronunciation, McOat, is that correct? McCowett, yes. McCowett, well, I was close. Welcome, Shannon. Uh, this, is Thank a, you. this is a proclamation for National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. Whereas hospice and palliative care empower people facing a serious or life-limiting illness to live as fully as possible, ensuring people dignity, choice, and quality of life. And whereas the hospice model involves an interdisciplinary team-oriented approach to treatment, including expert medical care, quality symptom control, and comprehensive pain management as a foundation of care. Whereas beyond providing physical treatment, hospice attends to the patient's emotional, spiritual, and family needs and provides family services like respite care and bereavement counseling. Whereas in an increasingly fragmented and broken healthcare system, hospice is one of the few sectors that demonstrates how healthcare can and should work at its best for its patients. And whereas a growing body of peer reviewed research indicates that timely access to hospice and palliative care can decrease hospitalizations and emergency room visits and increase quality of life for patients and family caregivers. Whereas every year more than 1.5 million Americans living with life-limiting illness and their families receive care from the nation's hospice programs in communities throughout the United States, whereas more than 400,000 trained volunteers contribute 19 million hours of service to hospice programs annually in the United States, whereas Central Coast Hospice, Dignity Health Hospice, Hospice of San Luis Obispo County, 
and Wilshire Hospice provide hospice care and bereavement counseling respectively to individuals within the County of San Luis Obispo. And whereas hospice and palliative care organizations are advocates and educators about advanced care planning that help individuals make decisions about the care they want. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Stephen W. Martin, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor and speaking on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby proclaim November 2020 as National Hospice and Palliative Care Month and encourage citizens to increase their understanding and awareness of care at the end of life and to observe this month with appropriate activities and programs. Would you like to make a couple of comments? I would. Thank you so much for um for recognizing this important um <laughs> this important effort for us hospice of san luis Obispo county envisions a community that recognizes death as a part of life where dying and grieving are embraced as natural where all have access to support services without charge where no one dies or is left to grieve without comfort i want to acknowledge our community partners in central coast hospice Dignity Health Hospice and Wilshire Hospice, who collaborate with Hospice of San Luis Obispo County to provide hospice and palliative care in our community. On behalf of our entire hospice community, thank you for your support. And once again, thank you and all the folks involved in those organizations for the services they provide for our citizens. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Next, we come to general public comments. This is the time the public may address the council on items within the council's purview, but not scheduled on the agenda this evening. Please begin by stating your name and address. Each person is limited to three minutes. Any person or subject requiring more than three minutes may be scheduled for a future council meeting or referred to committee or staff. Those persons wishing to speak on any item scheduled on the agenda will be given an opportunity to do so at the time that item is being considered. I want to take this uh, this time to remind folks that we have had some reports of some outages of internet services. If you're having problems with your internet and accessing this meeting, you can hear the meeting on the airwaves on our local radio station, KPRL, that's 1230 on your AM dial. And the phone number to call for public comments is 805-865-7276. With that being said, do we have people waiting to make general public comments? No, sir. Thank you very much. We'll close general public comment and move on with our agenda. Next up, I'll ask the city manager if we have any agenda items to be deferred this evening. No, sir. Next on our agenda is the consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered routine, not requiring separate discussion. However, if discussion is wanted by a member of the council or public, the item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Council members and members of the public may offer comments or ask questions of clarification without removing an item from the calendar. Individual items are approved by the vote that approves the consent calendar unless an item is pulled for separate consideration. Items pulled from the consent calendar are generally heard at the end of the meeting. That being said, let's start with our city council comments. Items to be pulled, Councilman Gregory. <clears throat> None at this time, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Hammond? None, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Strong? Item number nine, Mr. Chairman, please. Item number nine, do you wish to ask a question or do you wish to have it pulled? I wish to have it pulled. Very good. Item number nine has been pulled from the consent calendar. Councilwoman Garcia? No, sir. Thank you. Going now to the public, is there anybody waiting online to ask a question about a consent ca uh, calendar item or to have an item removed? Your Honor, we have four callers to comment on item number nine, which was just pulled. Okay. Um, that Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, make a motion that if we can go ahead and hear that at this time. Okay. So what I would what I would recommend is let's go ahead and act on the balance consent calendar and then uh, go to that item right away rather than putting it at the end of the agenda if there are no objections. Copy that. Very good. So. That being said, uh, we'll close public comment on the consent calendar. I will entertain a motion to uh, pass the balance of that calendar. Mayor Martin? Yes. Mayor Martin, are, we, are we sure there's no other questions from callers on the other items? Uh, my understanding is we're all we're about item nine. Am I in error on that? You're correct, sir. There are no other callers for other items. Very good. So I make a motion that we approve four 
through eight and 10 through 13 on the consent agenda. Second. Strong seconds. I have a motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Hammond. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Aye. Mayor Martin? Aye. Okay, we're going now to item number nine on the consent calendar. This is the item amending uh, a title section of the Pastoral's Municipal Code setting cannabis business tax rates. Can we get a staff report on that, please? Um, so, Mayor and Council, this item is the adoption of the cannabis tax rate ordinance. Um, as you may recall from the last meeting, uh, the council reviewed the options. The voters adopted measure I-18 in 2018, adopting uh, maximum tax rates for various cannabis businesses. And so the ordinance would actually set those taxes uh, while it was passed in 2018. We haven't actually adopted the ordinance to set the tax. Uh, the council reviewed that and um, the ordinance would set the uh, tax at the maximum rates except for the cannabis delivery businesses, which would be set at 6% instead of the maximum 10%. Um, no other, the only cannabis businesses currently allowed in the city are uh, medical marijuana delivery businesses. And so this with us and the only two, the only storefront businesses, there are two in town, um, though the tax would apply to other med medical delivery businesses. Um, the uh, council though also also gave direction to proceed with a process to review expanding the current prohibitions on uh, cannabis businesses. And so that will be a process that's getting underway. Council members Hammond and Garcia were appointed, uh, were selected. And so that committee is getting together to review whether the, the city is going to revisit its current cannabis business um, process and, and prohibitions, as I noted, only the medical marijuana delivery businesses are currently allowed. So that will be the process to get underway and look at the zoning code. And uh, the, the tax, though, would just set the ordinance at the maximum rates, except for cannabis delivery businesses at 6% instead of the 10%. And this is the second reading to adopt that tax. That will uh, see if there's any questions. Very good. Uh, we will go to council for questions of staff before we go to public comment, then return to the council for discussion. Councilman Gregory. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Councilman Hammond. No questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Strong. I don't think I have questions at this time. I want to hear the public comments. Thank you. Councilwoman Garcia. No, sir. Thank you. We'll go now to public comment. I'll ask our staff who is first up to give public comment this evening. First public comment is Grace Hall. Very good. Grace, are you with us? Hello, I'm here. Welcome. You're up. Okay. Hi, my name is Grace Hall. I'm the owner of Dove Green Garden. We have been in operation since 2012. Dove's Green Garden received its state license in May 2018 for cannabis medical delivery. We are based out of Paso Robles. We are the only, we are only medical. We are not recreational. San Luis Obispo and Atascadero currently tax all state licensed delivery services that deliver in their town 6%. San Luis Obispo and Atascadero both require all state licensed delivery services to reg register with them and pay taxes. The way I understand the 6% tax that Paso will be imposing on us is we will only be imposing a 6% tax on our business, Dubs Green Garden and Lethal Life, which are the only two state licensed medical cannabis delivery services that are based out of Paso. But you will not be imposing this tax on recreational cannabis and the delivery services that deliver from San Luis Obispo County and the many other recreational delivery services that come from all over California and deliver freely to Paso Robles residents every day, they won't have to pay a dime in tax. There is also still a thriving black market that delivers cannabis every day in Paso Robles as well. This does not seem to be fair to the two cannabis businesses that operate in your town. I do not feel that we are being supported by our city council. There is no other industry that operates in Paso Robles that would be treated in this way. Please understand we provide cannabis to medical patients only. This tax will be passed on to the medical consumer. Many of our medical customers are sick, disabled, and live on fixed incomes. 
We have no issue with paying a tax to our city. We simply ask that you implement fair taxes across the board, which includes everyone that delivers cannabis in our town. When I-18 was put on the ballot in November 2018, it was said no other cannabis businesses existed in Paso Robles. Deb's Green Garden had already been licensed out of Paso for six months. I-18 was vaguely written, not stating whether it would be imposed on medical or recreational cannabis sales. There are many residents who voted on I-18 not knowing it would be imposed on medical cannabis two years later. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate it. Who do we have next? Next is Sarah Calderon. Welcome, Sarah. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Sarah Calderon, and I am the co-owner with my husband of Lethal Life Delivery. We opened in Paso Robles at the beginning of 2020, licensed for medical only. And since the quarantine was announced, we have seen a decline in sales as people compensate for being out of work. They can't afford to pay fees for cards and high prices on products nowadays, so they seek out a black market service with harmful homemade products or recreational licensed dispensaries or delivery services based elsewhere, like San Luis. This has hurt not only us, but other licensed medical companies. Placing a 6% tax on us would only push us to the brink of bankruptcy. We already pay the state excise tax of 27%, plus state sales tax of 7.75, and 4 to 6% local tax in Atascadero and San Luis. Currently, we are limited to only medical card sales. Other companies are permitted to deliver to Paso Robles and sell both medically and recreationally. Their profits are taken out of Paso Robles and you are not even asking for them to be taxed to 6% too. So it seems to be unfairly targeting Leaf of Life and Dub's Green Garden. We're not asking for a dispensary. We're not asking for anything. We are happy as a delivery service, but need to be competitive in pricing and cannot afford to attach more tax that has to be passed on to the customer. If we had a recreational license, at least we would be able to reach more people generating more revenue for taxes in the end for you guys. I humbly request you wait on this tax and consider licensing us for adult use, which all the outside companies already possess and are not benefiting PASO with their taxes. So please humbly wait on this tax. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And who is next? Next is Kai Cauldron. Welcome, Kai. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Councilmen. My name is Kai Calderon. I'm the owner of Leaf of Life Delivery. <clears throat> My concerns with the new tax is that it will cripple our business, and it only targets two businesses, not all the delivery services operating in Slow County. As of now, the fact that we are only licensed for medical deliveries, very little is generated in taxable revenue. Few people hold medical cards anymore or want to pay the fees associated with getting a medical card. The council is only voting to tax two businesses in Paso Robles. Why? When the other delivery services based in SLO and throughout the county are allowed to deliver to Paso Robles and are licensed for recreational and medical, generating triple the amount of taxable revenue, but not paying Paso Robles. They're actually taking it out of SLO County back to Los Angeles, or San Francisco, where they're from. The black market is thriving due to taxes being so high on our business that we already have by state and other local cities taking their percentage. More taxes means we have to raise already high prices on products. People are already struggling and will just turn more to unlicensed dealers, black market, or just stay recreational. Licensing our business for recreational adult use sales would be the solution to these problems. We could compete with outside delivery companies, saving our business, generating more tax revenue for community, and help cut out the black market sales that target the kids. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. 
And do we have someone else? Next is Carolyn McNichol. Very good. Carolyn, welcome. Hello. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. I'm not actually any kind of politician or any business person or anything. I am very grateful to get the opportunity to address this issue. I am a 63-year-old retired court reporter from San, uh, San Luis Obispo and Los Angeles. <clears throat> I retired after 30 years with the state of California, and I've been left with chronic health conditions. I have osteoarthritis, osteophytes covering my spine and feet. I have a carpal tunnel in both wrists. They want to do operations on my feet and hands. I could go anywhere in this county and get a doctor to give me opiates, and I have done that route. It took me three years to recover from the opiates just by doing it myself, but it was like killing me. So I found Dub's Green Garden. And he is providing my medicine. I am on a fixed income. And I don't have to take, you know, they talk about the black market. You don't have to go to the black market. I can go out and get opiates for $5 a month and die of an overdose. And with the amount of suffering that's going on in this state, this county, this country right now, why would you put a tax on suffering people that are just trying to get medicine? Dub's Green Garden is my provider. And I feel like, you know, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a drinker. I don't do anything illegal. I pay taxes. I paid $40,000 in income tax. And I, I don't think I can afford more taxes. Our president doesn't even pay taxes, and I have to pay that much. And I, How am I going to afford the medicine that helps me live and so that I'm not depressed? I'm sorry. I tried. I was going to be so professional. I'm sorry, but this matters to me. I'm a human being and I matter. I'm Carolyn McNichol. I'm from Templeton and thank you for listening. Carolyn, thank you for calling. And obviously, uh, you're very passionate about this with good reason. I hope you realize that we're sensitive to hearing your comments. Thank you very much for calling. Do we have anyone else waiting for public comment? No, sir. We'll close public comment, bring it back to the council. There are a couple of comments with implied questions I think we should address before we get into discussion. First of all, can we have uh, someone on staff address the concern that the 6% tax on medical marijuana products is not being applied to outside vendors that could be delivering in the city? Uh, Mayor Martin, this is Kimberly Hood. Um, I can answer that question. Um, I think that's a misreading of the ordinance. The ordinance states that um, all retail deliveries occurring in the city will be subject to 6%. It says that uh, the cannabis tax is imposed on any person, quote, engaged in operating or otherwise conducting a cannabis business, unquote, within the city, regardless of whether the business, so that's regardless of whether they have a business license. Uh, and then the definition section expressly states that they have to be, to have the tax apply, they have to be engaged in a cannabis business, which includes the business coming into the city from outside in the location uh, in section 3.22 point zero three zero j so uh, i don't think it, it doesn't apply just to those two businesses now that said there are the only two legal businesses delivering in the city are dubs and um, leaf of life uh, that we're aware of so then it becomes an enforcement issue and trying to collect the tax from those that are still producing deliveries um, as to the recreational that's that would be the next step in the process but but that is the current drafting of the ordinance okay that that was my next question was uh, in the application of the ordinance and the impact on what is a black market or at least a business operating on the fringes uh, off our radar, a gray market in these goods. Uh, it's, it, I would assume that it's kind of difficult to identify those businesses and apply this law to them. Is there a process to do that? So I, I would defer to Mr. Cornell on the process of, that they follow in actually collecting the tax. I do know it can be difficult because um, obviously you have to know who's delivering and where. There are, I believe, some websites that help track that, similar to like your short-term rentals, right, where uh, we were trying to find out who was do, using their, their residence for a short-term rental and not paying the tax. So there are abilities to try and track those um, businesses. Um, but obviously it's, it's, it is, it can be a difficult enforcement issue. 
Okay, and then one final question before we go around to um, uh, to the council. Uh, is, is this a time sensitive issue? Is this something that we have to establish uh, these rates for pro forma reasons, or is this something we have some latitude on? So Mr. Mayor, I'll address that. There is no uh, legal urgency. The uh, reason we are bringing it to you at this time is both because of the city's financial uh, problems, as well as we know there are, in addition to Dubs and Leaf of Life, there are services based outside the city who have been obtaining a business license that are delivering within the city. And now that Grover Beach and City of Slow have established their processes, they have been fairly successful in enforcement um, by a partnership between the finance department and the police department to ensure that everyone is getting a business license and those that have the business license are, are paying the appropriate taxes. But if the council uh, felt it was best to delay this, that is certainly the council's decision. I just wanted to know if it was, you know, we have, we've established an ad hoc and we're reaching out to the community to um, review the situation as far as the sales of uh, cannabis products in the city. I uh, just wonder if there's a reason we couldn't fold this into that discussion or whether this had to come first. It's solely the council's decision, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, uh, council uh, discussion. We'll start with Councilman Gregory. Yes, um, well, for for discussion purposes, um, I think it would be a good idea to make sure that everybody delivering the city is being treated the same way and not just our, our homegrown businesses. So anybody coming to the city that has a license, I think we should uh, make sure that everybody's gonna be paying that tax before we levy it against just our own businesses. Um, that's my two cents on it right now, I think that it's difficult for me to want to approve a tax if we're not charging everybody in the game the same the same fee. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Councilman Hammond. Yeah, my uh, direction I think it would be to direct staff to research um, vehicles of uh, uh, understanding who these people are. In other words, just like we mentioned again on the uh, short-term rentals, there's applications out there that we can understand who and where uh, product is being sold from outside our city. Again, I definitely uh, want to sustain our local businesses and then uh, not treat them unfairly at all. That's the point. So, I mean, if there are people um, doing this under the line, um, then we need to bring them up and uh, use all legal remedies to acquire them to uh, you know, pay the tax again, just like our other folks do. Very good, thank you. Councilman Strong? Yes, thank you. You know, in, in many ways, this is reminiscent of prohibition. And that is that, uh, you know, the, the people want something and they're gonna find a way to get it. And if you have a business that is legitimately doing it, and you tax them heavily and others are able to function without being discovered, then you have actually hurt your own business. And I think that's the situation we have right here. Also, I don't think we got full information last time. We were told that these businesses had only licenses for medical marijuana. My understanding is that the state license is a combined license. These people are authorized by the state to do either medical or recreational or and recreational, but we've restricted them in our case to only the medical. Now, you know, when the voters speak and they speak loudly enough that they're willing to actually come out and pass a, a law uh, by an initiative, then I think it's time for us to listen and realize that your public uh, is, is telling you something. So when they're telling you something, I think you really have to listen and we have it. I think we should delay the adoption of this ordinance, keep the ad hoc going, get the public input, and actually research more what the other cities are doing and try to come in line so that we are, are consistent with the rest and, and competitive. We shouldn't be passing anything that's gonna pit our own businesses out of business. That's not the business of city council, in my opinion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilwoman Garcia. Yes, sir. So I'm just trying to get all the facts here. Um, I have a question. So uh, one of the callers said that they were paying state tax, um, but we as the city, they haven't been paying us any tax. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Oh, um, okay. That's all I have for now. Thank you. So uh, in in going over this information, going over this issue, listening to our public comments uh, from local people, and I'm sure that you've all received the same type of emails and communications I've received since uh, we last considered this, it seems like it boils down to at least three points here. First of all, fairness to our businesses and to their customers, because they are kind of put between a rock and a hard place when it comes to executing legally, while at the same time being treated uh, equitably with uh, other businesses from outside of the area. Also, I'm really concerned that uh, an un unintended consequence of doing an untimely uh, ordinance would be to magnify the activities of what I refer to as the gray market or the black market. We, if this is going to be uh, a normalized product and service in our community, the voters of the state have said that this is a, a, an acceptable product for our communities, then we need to make sure that the, the, uh, the, the factions that would take unfair advantage of that on a black market should not be allowed to prevail. And finally, as was alluded to by our city manager earlier, there are financial considerations to be taken into account for our city. We see other cities in our county who are increasing their market share in this product line, uh, much of it coming from our, our city, I'm sure. And these are revenues which could come to our city, help pay for our police department, our fire department, our services that we really should not be leaving on the table. That being said, I think that we took the action that we've done to date in good faith and trying to approach this incrementally, but the communications I've received seem to indicate that it would be more equitable if we delayed this particular part of the process and fold the, the discussion in with the overall discussion of our task force regarding uh, the future of marijuana products in our community. I fully expect that worst case scenario, we're gonna wind up right back where we are right now with a minimum tax on medical products that'll be applied across the board Plus, it'll give us the opportunity to discuss with our community uh, other applications of uh, cannabis law and sales uh, on a wider basis. So my recommendation would be to do that. Uh, council comments back at the top. Councilman Gregory. Yeah, Mayor Martin, um, I, uh, I do uh, uh, respect your comments, but I'm, I would be, I'd be worried to tie these to the ad hoc group because the ad hoc process could take a long time because it's a much bigger concept or issue that we're gonna be approaching. So um, I think like uh, Councilman Hammond said it pretty well is get staff on board and figure out a way to get this in place so that it's fair to everybody and not just penalizing our own businesses. But I think I would keep that on a different track. And just to, man just to make sure that Right now, what's going to happen is we're going to continue to lose out on sales until the end of the ad hoc process, which I think could take too long because the issues that ad hoc on the ad hoc uh, group are going to be much larger and more difficult to, um, I think, work out. So my, my only comment is I think we should have them on two different tracks, try to get the tax situation put in a place where it's fair to our local businesses and make sure we're getting the taxes from other licensed local businesses that are delivering to our city. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Councilman Hammond. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Councilman Gregory that uh, we should actually, I think, move forward with the agenda item because we're the last city, I understand, that uh, does not tax uh, at all. And so, I mean, when I see the numbers here, um, I'm happy with the percentages. They're not unfair to the medical marijuana, which is what I'm uh, partial to to make sure that they um, they can get their product as, as least expensive as possible. Uh, so at this point, I would favor to move forward. We can always get back to this ordinance later if we want to change it or modify it. Uh, right now, though, I think as far as city business and it's on the agenda, we uh, can go ahead and hear it and uh, make a vote. Thank you. Councilman Strong. Well, I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree. And I'm going to go back to a recent uh, Supreme Court ser series of hearings. And uh, now Justice Amy Comey Barrett 
who was challenged on her religion. And I believe that a lot of us have very personal beliefs, and, and I don't uh, personally uh, want to participate in or use met, uh, recreational uh, cannabis. But I see that uh, there are many people who do, and there are many other products that are actually offered in the stores that, that exist that aren't just recreational, but they're cannabis-based. I think that this was not well thought out. I like uh, Councilman Gregory's idea of a dual track. And by a dual track, I mean have the ad hoc continue its investigation and get more input from the community. But send it back to staff. Do not pass it tonight. Send it back to staff to bring it at least in line with what the other communities are doing so that our particular businesses are not disadvantaged by this. It's not going to put any money in our pocket if we put our only businesses out of business before we start collecting many taxes, uh, that's not a way to raise revenue. And this shouldn't be just about revenue. It has to be about what's best for the community, what's best for our businesses, what's best for the citizens. And I don't think we have acted wisely or judicially, judiciously in this particular matter at this time. I hope that we will not pass this tonight We'll send it back to staff to be reanalyzed and rewritten to bring us in line with the other cities. And meantime, we have a second track with the ad hoc committee to bring back further recommendations as to exactly how much and where we're going to allow different things. But if certain things are being allowed in other places right in this area and people are getting things online and, and from out of area deliveries, and I don't think you're going to stop every U UPS truck, every FedEx truck, uh, or the United States mail to find out what's coming through that might be delivered to our, our people. Uh, I, I think this needs a lot of work, and I don't think this is the time to pass this right now and wind up putting two businesses out of business. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Garcia. Yes, sir. I completely agree with Mr. Strong. Um, I just don't think that it's um, that it's fair that the two businesses that are trying to do it properly and correct um, are the ones that are going to have to pay the tax. I think we should wait, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question of staff regarding what other communities are doing. If I remember the staff report when we first heard this item, the, uh, the rate we set for medical marijuana was comparable to other cities offering that, was it not? Uh, Mayor, that's correct. Um, uh, Correct. Uh, this is the the delivery businesses, um, which would in some some communities would also encompass recreational as well. But it was our understanding that Grover Beach was at I believe five percent, and San Luis Obispo was at six percent. So this may be an overly broad question, but I'll ask it anyway. How in in what other ways do does the delivery of cannabis products in our community differ from those communities? Is there something other than the tax rate that affects that? In terms of delivery I, services. I, not that I'm aware of. So. I, I agree with the city attorney. Sorry. Not In terms of delivery me. services, nothing that we know of, no, sir. Okay, I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what other things we would study from other communities to bring this in line with them where we might be, you know, sticking out on our own. Okay, uh, top of the list again, Mr. Gregory. Okay, so I don't know if anybody on staff knows what uh, San Luis and Grover Beach are doing for collecting from out of city providers delivering to their cities. But I think that would be something. The way I'll, I'll take a shot at a motion for you. How's that? Or should I go around one more time? No, go ahead. Make a motion. We can have discussion on the motion if need be. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we we have we keep our ad hoc on one track, and we take this tax issue on another track. And that that, that track is to ask staff to review and look at a way for us to collect taxes from everybody delivering to our city, uh, so that it's fair to our local businesses that are providing that same service. It's, it seems to be the best thing to do, so it's unilaterally fair to our businesses, and it would also uh, generate more income for our city in the fairest ways we know how. So I would move that we do it that way. Oh, yeah, Steve, um, maker of the motion, uh, the ordinance is basically what the 
issue is tonight is to adopt the ordinance or not. Um, so your motion really doesn't address the main issue of the agenda item. So, I mean, we can certainly talk about that, uh, and I would agree that we should. Uh, but as far as the actual ordinance moving forward to allow the city to be able to charge uh, a tax is really what this is all about tonight. So, uh, let's so, so we have, we, have, oh, 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 we have we have a motion. I will second it for purposes of discussion, Mr. Gregory. Yeah, back to Kimberly. So Kimberly, um, would if we were to discover a way to charge taxes to everybody so it was fair to all incoming deliveries to the city, would we have to rewrite this ordinance anyway? Or could we amend it? No, I don't believe so. The, you can amend if you want to change the tax rate, but I don't believe you have to amend to capture taxes from other delivery businesses because the definition is already very broad to encompass all delivery businesses engaged in cannabis delivery, even those that that originate outside of the city. So, so for us to continue the item until we have the information we need, we would be able to keep the ordinance in place. Sounds like it, Steve. Uh, Kimberly, you could. Kimberly, go ahead. Kimberly, yeah. yeah. If you could answer the question. Okay. Please. So I was just going to suggest you, you. Yes, you could certainly you can adopt the ordinance, which would then have the tax in in. It will be set then. Uh, it doesn't become effective for the the thirty days from adoption. Um, and then I do, I know administrative services is working on the aspects of how to collect the tax and that, but it does already cover, uh, other businesses, other delivery businesses, not just the two businesses within Pastor Robles. So let me, let me ask another question. So could we extend that timeline to like 60 days? So we have adequate time to figure out how to collect taxes from everybody to keep it fair. Uh, you can. Um, I am only hesitating since we're at adoption and second reading. The effective date in the, the ordinance is 30 days from adoption. Um, however, we could uh, return, you know, the city can administratively not start collecting the tax right away. It just sets the tax at the effective date. So if the, the council could adopt the ordinance, the ordinance would become effective within 30 days, which allows the collection. And then uh, as a second piece of the motion, direct staff to, uh, to stay uh, enforcement of the tax collection um, until either a date certain or follow up with it with, um, with the council on those collection procedures. But at least then you would have the tax in place. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead and then I have discussion. All right, so um, I don't know if I want to restate it the way you said it, but anyway, so the way I understand, if I made my motion saying that we'd like to pass the ordinance for the tax rate, but we would ask that staff come back at a future date certain so that we could administrate the collection of the taxes once we figure out how we're going to collect it all. Uh Yes, I would have that as a, a wait, a, wait for the reading, introduce, I mean, I'm sorry, adopt the ordinance, and then as a second piece to defer collection of the tax uh, until there's a follow-up report with the council. Councilman Hammond? Yeah, I was going to uh, suggest maybe if I make a motion here. Um, well, we've got a motion on the table, so yeah, I want to that's, Yeah, we got to get rid of this for a second. So, Councilman so, uh, Gregory? Would, would you please would, restate would, your motion or at least re reform your motion so that we can have something to act on here? I will withdraw my motion to hear what Mr. Very Hammond good. Motion is uh, uh, withdrawn. Uh, Council thank, him. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me go ahead and make a motion and see if this works. Um, and basically, in you know, the report, basically it says to waive the, the motion, then, therefore, is to waive uh, further reading of it and adopt ordinance 1104 NS to the for the city of uh, Paso Robles. Amending section 3.22.010 of Title Three of the Pass Robles Municipal Code and setting cannabis business tax rates, along with having a stay of 60 days uh, from this date of any taxes to be collected. I guess if Kimberly maybe clean up that language, but basically we're going to in institute this. Uh, and get it into motion, but yet hold off on collecting until we establish um, ways of, of 
doing it fairly against uh, others that aren't really playing by the rules currently. So if I, if I may, Councilman Hammond, if I understand what you're saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, your motion would be to go ahead and pass the action in front of us, but delay administrative collection of taxes for 60 days. Okay, correct. As of right now, that would give us 30 days for the ordinance to become a fact, and another 30 days before actually the city could collect. But maybe at that point, the staff would come back with another item for us to discuss. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I will second that, Garcia. I have a motion by Councilwoman Garcia. Discussion. Uh, my discussion is, uh, playing devil's advocate here, we buy 30 days with this action. What do we anticipate coming back to us in that additional 30 days, and what would be the action at the end of that 30 days to change all of this? Would we, would we then have to take action to negate this ordinance if we found something that we didn't like in it or how would that be handled well i'm personally interested in making sure that our two businesses are protected uh fairly compared to others uh in our area and from what i understand that staff would be able to research ways of uh, bringing everyone selling cannabis in our town uh up to this level of uh exposure if you will okay uh, so i I just want to make sure I understand, John. I'm, 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 if I if I understand what you're saying, then the additional time would be used to explore ways to enforce the cannabis yeah. where we are. We would pass. Is that right? Good work. Yeah, it's good word. Um, and then maybe staff's comment on if that's doable. I, I'm not sure. Okay. And that's my next question of staff. Is this something that is realistic, doable, or are we just making the waters muddier without any progress? I believe the approach is appropriate and wise. The 60 days would be January 3rd, and we're not going to be able to make a whole lot of progress the last two weeks of December, first week or two of January, just because of everything else going on in the holidays. So if, if this could be um, delayed till either 75 days or 90 days, I think it would be uh, more likely to be accomplished. And those are my thoughts also, and, and, and it leads me back to my thoughts that if we're looking at a 90-day delay here, then we're not really buying any time off the discussion process. The rationale for going ahead tonight was it would take too long in the broader discussion of cannabis sales. I'm kind of thinking we're going to have that discussion, discussion in 90 to 120 days, so I, I feel like we're overly complicating this and not buying ourselves that much benefit. Other than the fact that the city's losing revenue in that period of time, I mean, that's the reason for this ordinance, I believe, Mr. Mayor, was to get something on the books. Um, and it takes 30 days to even get that started. But we're also giving them another 60 days at this point, so a total of 90 before the city could uh, actually request you know, funds to be delivered to the city. So right. I, I just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to say I, I – because they've done all the staff work and everything's ready to go, I don't have a problem moving forward. It's just that we're not going to pull the trigger on implementing the ordinance. Okay. I just believe that 60 days is probably too short a period of time. And the amount of sales that we're going to miss between 90 days uh, and 60 days is probably minimal. But again, those are just my comments. Other, other comments, uh, Councilman Strong. Yes, Mr. Mayor, and I totally agree. 90 days, you know, it's, it's number one, if this is so onerous to our existing businesses, we're not going to get the revenue we think we're going to get. They may be out of business, and it'll take a whole lot longer to get new businesses in after this experience. I think you take the 90 days now and do it right or forget it. Very good. I'm okay, so we have a motion in a second. Ninety day period. Thank you. We have a motion and a second, and let's start at the top. Mr. Gregory, uh, comments? I would agree with the 90 days. As long as I like the idea of getting the ordinance passed, and I don't have a problem waiting an extra 30 days to get more time for the staff to get it right. Very good. Mr. Hammond? Agreed. Same comment. Okay, Mr. Strong? With 90 days, I'll, I'll accept this. Very good. Ms. Garcia? Uh, I'm on the same boat, sir. Thank you. So we have a motion, a second. Everyone's had a chance to comment. 
If I understand the motion is to go ahead and pass this tonight, but with a 90 day period before implementation, am I correct on that? That's correct. Okay, can we have a roll call vote please? Mr. Mayor, a question? Mr. Could I ask Mr. A question? Strong. Yes, Mr. Strong. Within that 90 days, depending upon what comes back to us, could it come back with suggested amendments to the ordinance as passed so that we could amend it at the same time? I'll leave that up to the city attorney. Uh, we can we can come back to look at amendments to the ordinance if there's a desire to do so once we are ready to report back to council with, before that 90 days is up. But as I understand it, as I understand it, Kimberly, this is basically passing the ordinance and extending the 30 day implementation, which is the usual time frame to 90 days. Does that not mean that at the end of 90 days that we would have to come back and uh, rescind this ordinance before we could change it? You wouldn't have to rescind, you could amend it. Um, and that's why it, if the council was so inclined, you could uh, amend the motion to ask staff to come back with proposed amendments. Obviously you're not required to, if it's adopted tonight, uh, it will go into effect in 30 days with the administrative delay on any in collection of the tax uh, and enforcement of that. Uh, you're looking at the additional 90 days. So I think the question is, per Mr. Strong's question, is there interest in also pursuing additional amendments? I, I, we don't have any direction on what those amendments would be at this time. We'll certainly be looking at it. And if there's some appropriate amendment, we could bring that forward. But that uh, we don't have that in front of us, what the amendment would look like at this time. Very good. Last round of discussion, Mr. So Gregory. See if there's direction. Mr. Gregory. I'm good with the way it's suggested. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. I'm uh, just going to mention that our ad hoc has not scheduled any meetings that I know of currently, okay. so it'll be a while, I think. Thank you, Mr. Strong. No, I, I, with those understandings, I think we can we can proceed, and I hope our ad hoc gets on the ball and, and starts. Very good. Ms. Garcia. I'm okay with it, sir. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Hammond. Aye. Council Member Garcia. Aye. Council Member Gregory. Aye. Council Member Strong. Aye. Mayor Martin. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. That concludes our consent calendar. Before we move on, I'll ask the city manager to give us a short report of what we've done tonight so that people who have not had a chance to look at the consent calendar, what actions we've taken. And I would remind folks that you can see the consent calendar prior to the meeting as part of our regular agenda, which is posted at drcity.com. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Your Honor. This evening on its consent calendar, the council approved the city council minutes from October 20th. They approved amended city council minutes from October 6th, and the amendment was just a change in the number of a resolution. They received the warrant register, and the warrant register this time is rather large compared to normal, totaling $3.6 million, but 2.4 million of that was the purchase of 2955 Union Road for the overpass over Highway 46, which is a vital long-term project of the city. The council also approved a final map for 2145 Ardmore Road. And this is the split of a 7.2 acre parcel into two roughly equal parcels of about 3.6 acres each. And the parcel map was tentatively conditionally approved by the city council in 2018. The council also authorized staff to remove five Valley Oaks, which is something we none of us like doing. Unfortunately, they were planted between side the sidewalks and the street on Via Manzanita, Manzanita as well as Via Car Carmelia. And they have caused significant damage to the sidewalks and hazardous conditions. So they are being replaced with five more suitable street trees consistent with the other trees in the area, as well as six oaks to be planted on public property elsewhere in the city in locations better suited to the growth untrammeled growth of oak trees. The council also approved a regional early action planning grant, a REAP grant for $152,000 to, to streamline our entitlement and permitting processes and community development. 
to update the zoning code to correct inconsistencies and make the code more user friendly and to update the 2011 Uptown Town Center specific plan. There is no requirement for a matching fund on this grant. The council also approved the per capita grant for $178,000. That also requires no, ma uh, no match. And it is a non-competitive grant to provide funds to assist um, severely disadvantaged communities um, have open space and recreational areas primarily for children. And so we are dedicating the, these funds to an upgrade to Uptown Family Park. And that I believe are all of the items the council approved tonight on the consent calendar. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Moving on now, item number 14 under discussion, purchase of improvements at 4301 Second Wind Way. Staff report, please. Mr. Cornell will make, be making this report, Your Honor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, uh, Ryan Cornell, Director of Administrative Services. Um, just wanted to let you know too, also on the call tonight, um, is our uh, real estate uh, professionals, uh, Marty Invic and Jeff Allen from uh, Lee & Associates. Uh, so tonight I have the opportunity to present to you the consideration of purchasing uh, leasehold interests, building and improvements uh, located at uh, 4031 Second Wind Way. Uh, Second Wind Way is uh, located out by the airport off of Dry Creek Road, uh, just west of the Estrella War, uh, Warbird Museum. Um, as indicated um, on the uh, red circle uh, on the slide. Uh, this site has been identified as a more uh, cost-effective option for the current city offices and facilities located at 821 Pine Street. That's the uh, home of the City Hall Annex. Um, and at 629, or 625 Riverside Avenue, uh, which is the city's corporation yard. Second here, son. The slide's not turning for me. There. Okay. Uh, the property contains uh, five structures, uh, two office buildings, uh, one of which is currently being utilized by Greater California Financial. Uh, there are two airport or air, uh, airplane hangars on the lower uh, parcel portion of the parcel, and then a large warehouse uh, right in the middle. Um, of the property, which is currently being um, leased by a local winery on a short-term basis. Um, overall, the improvements sit on a seven-plus acre lot, uh, and these buildings were built kind of right in the neighborhood of 2005. Uh, the city's airport fund already owns the land these structures sit on, so the uh, item for council's consideration is the purchase of these five buildings, uh, plus the current leases uh, for a total purchase price of 6110000 Um, as I just mentioned, the building in the northern east corner of the property is currently the home of the Greater California Financial. Uh, this building is about 6,400 square feet um, in space, um, and the lease is has uh, an additional seven years um, still on it, uh, with an option to extend for uh, an additional three years. Uh, the lease revenues generated from this uh, property is about 150,000 uh, per year. Uh, with CPI escalators uh, built into the lease agreement. Um, this would uh, generate an additional, again, 150,000 of general fund monies each year uh, should we move forward with this purchase. The site uh, also contains two air, uh, airplane hangars. Um, at about 3,200 square feet a piece. Uh, part of this uh, purchase sale agreement is to lease back one of these hangers uh, to the current uh, property owner or the, the seller um, at a discounted rate for two years. Um, I also spoke with Roger yesterday, um, and it sounds like we um, potentially have someone interested in that second hanger. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's anticipated that the hangers will generate about $15,000 worth of income per year. Uh, staff recommends that the airport fund actually purchases these two hangars um, and have the revenues it generates go back to the airport fund. Um, the reason being is this type of lease is what the airport does day in and day out. 
Uh, and since the hangars can't be used for anything other than airplanes, it, it kind of makes the most sense to keep airport related activity um, in the airport. Uh, this also uh, makes uh, more general fund dollars available uh, since they won't be needed towards the, the purchase of these, these hangars. Uh, the airport fund already has uh, funds appropriated uh, towards a hangar development project. Uh, there's no expenses uh, currently expended to date. Um, and so, and I'll get this, into this a little bit later in the council report, uh, but we'll um, recommend redirecting uh, those budgeted funds uh, towards the purchase of this property. The office complex in the northwestern portion of the property uh, would be the new home of the City Hall Annex staff located at 825 or 821 Pine Street. Uh, the, com uh, the complex encompasses about 6,400 square feet, uh, whereas the current building that we're in today is about 4,700 square feet. Um, additionally, the city does not own the current annex building and the city's general fund pays about $114,000 uh, each year in rent payments. Uh, by way of this purchase, the city's general fund will be no longer obligated for these lease payments and will be a direct savings. Uh, the city staff impacted by this move include human resources, uh, the finance division and information technology divisions, uh, which houses about 18 employees. Uh, these three dis uh, divisions, needless to say, help and support staff citywide. And one of the biggest challenges with, with this location of the office complex is that it's not centrally located. Uh, there is no way to mitigate that uh, this challenge, but I'm sorry, there's no way to completely mitigate this challenge, but we have learned how to be uh, more remote uh, via telework and tele telecommuting uh, since the coronavirus pandemic um, kind of has forced us in that position. Uh, there will be additional costs in incurred um, uh, with this not being centrally located, uh, such as broadband with um, additional city vehicles, um, and the related maintenance gas um, um, that goes along with any sort of vehicle, vehicle purchase. Um, but as of now, it seems that the benefits of getting out of the current lease and, and the, its related payments outweighs uh, the additional costs that will be incurred by moving um, out towards the airport. The last building on the property is a large uh, 40,000 plus square foot warehouse. Uh, which would be the new home of uh, the staff currently at 625 Riverside. Uh, the city sold its current site uh, back in fiscal year 2018-19 uh, with the intention of purchasing the Boy School property and moving fleet, park, facility maintenance staff there. However, uh, Gov uh, Governor Newsom issued an executive order mandating that all state-owned property be used towards affordable housing or housing for the ho for homeless uh, people. Uh, this has prevented the sale of the boys' school for over two years. Uh, but since we sold the property at Riverside, uh, the city's general fund has been paying lease payments uh, in the amount of $124,500 per year. Uh, again, similar to the annex building, uh, by way of this purchase, there will be a direct savings to the general fund by no longer needing to make these lease payments. Uh, the warehouse already has a couple office, uh, uh, offices inside of it, um, but it, which will be ideal for uh, some of the maintenance uh, supervisors, uh, but there will be additional construction and, and uh, improvements needed uh, so that it gets, uh, you know, get the building to what, you know, for the city to be able to use it. Uh, this includes vehicle lifts uh, for the fleet maintenance personnel. Uh, this includes uh, additional office spaces uh, for the fleet supervisor and the maintenance superintendent um, and kind of another, just a kind of a con an area for the crew to be able to congregate in. Uh, there is about 20 uh, employees impacted uh, by this move. Um, and again, it includes the uh, fleet, park, and facility divisions. Again, the, the cost of these five buildings and the leasehold interest is just north of $6 million. Uh, we're anticipating um, additional improvements and in studies um, at $890,000, uh, bringing the total one-time cost uh, to purchase this property um, at $7 million. So there are uh, several funding sources that staff is recommending uh, to be used uh, towards the purchase. Uh, the first one is the proceeds that we, the city um, has received from selling the Riverside property. Um, those funds are currently sitting in the capital improvement fund uh, for the uh, purchase of the boys school. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, a council's action, the recommended action would be to redirect those funds uh, towards the purchase of this property instead. Uh, that will contribute about 1.5, 1.6 million 
uh, of the $7 million needed. Uh, secondly, the city collects development impact fees, uh, which are fees the city charges to developers to offset the cost of public facilities uh, related to a development project. Uh, development impact fees are restricted. They are accounted for separately, and they are not part of the general fund. Um, and really, the, the, the funds can only be used for specific items that's identified on the needs list in the overall development impact fee report. Uh, there are currently four items on the needs list under the general government development impact fees. Uh, those include uh, the city hall expansion, which does include the annex, uh, public meeting facility, which would be the expansion of council chambers, uh, downtown parking, and then a consolidated corporation yard, um, and that would be the 625 um, Riverside. So it, it does get a little uh, complicated with how we're able to allocate these restricted resources. Um, very simplistically, the 100% um, of the purchase of the uh, warehouse can be um, used with development impact fees, uh, but only 31.77% uh, can be used towards the purchase of the annex building. So in, in total, general government development impact fees, uh, the fund balance there is about 6.4 million, um, of which this 3,702,500 can be used towards this purchase. Um, again, I want to reiterate that these funds are restricted. They can be only used for those uh, four um, items that I had just mentioned. Um, also, uh, the airport fund is intending to purchase the two hangars in the southern portion of the property. Uh, this will require a commitment of 377500 uh, but as I already mentioned, 270000 of, of that money is already appropriated for hangar development. So staff recommends redirecting those funds towards the purchase of this property uh, with an additional 107,500 coming from uh, airport fund reserves, uh, which has about 1.5 million in it today. Uh, the hangar development project was, it was intended for the design and construction of, new, of a new hangar pad with related water and sewer utilities. Uh, redirecting this budget would result in the same product, just constructed sooner and at a different location. And then lastly, um, I, I titled this un unrestricted resources are needed are needed to pick up the remaining million three hundred forty six thousand, which is roughly about 20 percent of the overall cost of the property. Staff recommendation is to utilize funds set aside for major repair and replacement of city facilities. Uh, this fund was established a couple of years ago and is similar to our vehicle replacement and IT fund where we set monies aside each year so that when a major purchase or uh, major uh, construction occurs, uh, there's already monies uh, readily available. However, the intent of those funds was to repair and replace existing facilities, not necessarily new facilities. However, though these funds are unrestricted and are available uh, to be spent at council's direction. There's currently about 3.2 million in the fund today with no specific use identified. The recommended plan would be to use these funds for the purchase of the property and then have the general fund replenish the building and repair replacement fund um, with the net positive impact the general fund is going to see uh, by way of this purchase. Uh, that'll take about three and a half years uh, to have the general fund uh, pay back this repair and replacement fund. Uh, additionally, another option that we have put in the staff report as option three, instead of using this uh, building repair and replacement fund, uh, city council could just direct the use of general fund reserves. Um, however, uh, staff's recommendation was to protect general fund reserves uh, as much as possible because of the pandemic. However, the economic activity is a little bit better than initially projected, um, so that is an option. Um, and would still be able to maintain that 30% reserve goal uh, by the end of the fiscal year. So the next steps uh, would be uh, <laughs> a lot in, in all actuality. Uh, so we'll sign this uh, purchase sell agreement uh, probably first thing tomorrow morning, and then we'll jump right into the, the 60 or 30 to 60 day due diligence period. Uh, this will be the city's opportunity to do the physical inspections of buildings, take soil and other ge uh, uh, geological samples, uh, send those off for testing, uh, evaluate the mechanical, electrical, HVAC, and other systems. Uh, we'll review building structural roof inspections, uh, take a look at the connectivity, uh, and, and all that good stuff. So if, if everything else pencils out 
and we move forward with, with closing, we're looking um, based on the, the seller's uh, wants uh, to close by the end of the, the calendar year. So not a whole lot of time, two months there. So, uh, and then um, the next step after we uh, move for, uh, out of the due diligence period would be to uh, kind of get a, a list of all the itemized on-site improvements that are needed, uh, get budgeted, Cost for each item, see how close we are to that uh, $890,000 preliminary estimate that's currently um, in the plan. Again, those improvements include um, the lifts for vehicles, uh, construction of some offices in the warehouse, um, and also includes developing the property right next to the um, this parcel, uh, kind of for an outdoor staging storage area for some of the pieces um, at the corporation yard that are too big for the warehouse. And then we move into, in, uh, into the timing of moving, which is um, a kind of a, a big a guess there. So the, these are estimated dates. Uh, the annex lease uh, doesn't expire, does not expire until July of 2022. Um, but the intent is to move out there sooner than later uh, because of uh, the build, the office building is currently vacant. Um, then we would uh, try to sublease the current uh, uh, building we're in or we'll try to negotiate away um, with the current landlord out of our current lease agreement. The Riverside lease expires at the end of January, um, and this could uh, present some challenges. Uh, we're currently negotiating with the cur current landlord, and uh, we're hopeful that we could get a couple more months um, at that current site uh, so that we can go ahead and construct some of the improvements um, and move in an appropriate amount of time. Um, there is a little bit of another curveball in there where there is a tenant currently in the warehouse building. Um, however, it is a short-term lease. Um, there would be a 90-day notice given on, um, in order for them to vacate. And currently, the, the amount of lease revenues that that property generates is um, exceeds the current lease payments at the annex and at the corp yard. So kind of all these factors are at play uh, when we're, we're looking at this. So uh, that uh, concludes my presentation for tonight. Uh, we're asking City Council to approve uh, Resolution 20-XXH, which does uh, three things. One, it authorizes city managers to actually execute the purchase sale agreement for, uh, again, the 6.1 million plus the lease back of one of the hangers to the seller. It reclassifies the budget currently directed towards the purchase of the boys' school, and then um, money is directed towards uh, the development hangar project. And then lastly, it appropriates um, all the monies, 3.7 from the general government development impact fee fund, um, an additional 107,500 from the airport fund, um, and 1,346,000 from the facility repair and replacement fund. Uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, but Tom, Kimberly, Marty, Jeff, anything else to add? Um, feel free to do so. Anything else? Anything else? I don't think so. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we'll have council questions followed by public comment, followed by council council consideration. Mr. Gregory. Yeah, Ryan, uh, just for clarification on the property itself, there's also a, about another five acres that's developable on that site. Is that true? So uh, the there is a vacant parcel. It is a separate parcel. Um, then from what is this under consideration? Uh, the airport fund does own that parcel too. It's about five, it is about five acres. Um, and I've already kind of made sure that Roger doesn't sell that or at least that um, parcel out to anybody else until we know um, what we're how we're going to utilize that that piece. But yes, there is a a parcel right next um, to this property that's just vacant land. Okay. And then um, in the options, it shows, um, the airport funds in the amount of three hundred seventy-seven thousand five hundred. Is that correct? Correct. That's the, that's that would be the total uh, airport funds contribution for the two airport hangars. Um, but two hundred and um, eighty thousand of that is already budgeted monies, um, and we would direct those elsewhere or towards the, this purchase. Okay, so that's in addition to those already budgeted funds. That, that was that's my the, adi the additional need would be 107500 Got it. All right. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hammond. 
Yes, Ryan. Uh, I, I, maybe I missed it. Uh, the seller uh, is paying rent on the hangar for two years that she's going to be using. Uh, I, did I miss the revenue? Uh, what What's that value? So the, the discounted value on, on the uh, lease back to the uh, seller is $400 a month. Um, but when we add in the second hangar, we're thinking that the airport fund should be able to get about 15000 per year uh, for the first couple of years and increase thereafter. Uh, you're losing me. So in other words, uh, for the first two years, the seller is paying 400 a month for one hangar. And then there is another hangar that's basically empty that we can lease to someone else. Uh, Correct. And so the total between the two, between the, the, the lease back to the seller and the, the new tenant, whomever that is, would total about 15000 a year. So a little more than $1,000 per month. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Yes, two questions. This does not impact the general fund, correct? The staff's recommendation is not to impact the general fund, no. Okay, and it does not require any additional revenue from taxpayers, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councilwoman Garcia. No questions right now, sir. Thank you. Very good. One more time before we go to public comment, Mr. Gregory. Um, so Ryan, technically this will affect the general fund because after we pay back the funds, we'll have a, a pretty nice income coming in after three years, correct? That, I'm sorry, you are correct. It, it, it doesn't adversely impact the general fund. Actually, the general fund uh, makes about uh, 370,000 to 380,000 a year uh, from the lease um, revenue that it's generating. So that would be a positive. And also on the second uh, uh, hangar that the, we're going to give a, a discount to on the current owner, that'll also generate more funds for the airport fund once she moves out. Correct. Okay. Just a clarification. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Anything else? Uh, well, quick question was regarding, I think there was about almost 900000 for improvements to the building that the annex would be moving to and, and i'm assuming that is interior renovation and also my main question is is the internet uh, service out there um has dave McHugh researched that and, and do we have speedy enough uh, service because it's always been a problem you know with our office out there at the airport um but is that being improved ryan or, or what's the status of uh, connectivity yeah, the, the improvements are, are actually more in the warehouse and, and needing to make sure the inside of the warehouse is usable uh, for the maintenance staff. Uh, the connectivity is something that we're going to address during the due diligence period. Um, I, we think there's just going to be an uh, annual increase in costs of, of the, connect, the connection that Charter runs out there. Um, but we'll have the details uh, once we get through that uh, due diligence period. Okay, thank you very much. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Well, I don't have anything additional. Uh, uh, just uh, I believe that uh, we're uh, in some negotiations right now that uh, might resolve some of that uh, uh, internet problem. Okay, uh, Ms. Garcia, any further questions? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, on the internet question, Ryan, uh, if we are going to, as part of this, uh, improve the internet service to the airport, is this something that's going to be marketable to existing businesses out there? Uh, that's not the intention. I think the intention is to run a single line to the um, buildings so that our needs are, are met. Um, but we definitely can take a bigger picture of the airport um, area and as a whole and see what we could do to improve connectivity. Um, Very there. good. Thank you. Okay, I understand uh, it's, uh, we have no further questions for the council at this point. Uh, open public comment. It's my understanding there is no one waiting to speak on that. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. We'll close public comment, bring it back to the council, Mr. Gregory. So I have a question of uh, Tom Frutchie here. So Tom, um, did we put in uh, the infrastructure for high-speed internet in Dry Creek Road when we reconstructed it? Conduit only, I believe. Uh, I, I believe Mr. Hammond's right. It was, it was only the conduit as of now. But it's conduit only, but it is conduit still. And there's, I guess we're negotiating on that as well. Okay. 
that's that's the only question else I wanted to add. Thank you. Okay, any comments, Mr. Hammond? Uh, make a motion if you're ready. Ready when you are. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion then to authorize the city manager to execute a purchase for and sale agreement for the leasehold value and improvements located at 4301 Second Windway for a total purchase price of six million one hundred and ten thousand and a short term rental lease back with the seller. Second. Okay, this is one resolution with three actions. Kimberly, can we do the whole thing at once? Yes, you can. Okay, okay. So John, would you like to make that inclusive then? Yeah, yeah I'll continue on then with uh, item two of the resolution. So item number two would then to reclassify capital improvement funds already appropriated towards the purchase of the boys school and airport funds already appropriated for airport uh, hangar development towards the purpose of this property and three appropriate 3.702 500,000 from the general fund government development impact fees fund 107,500 from the airport fund and 1,346,000 from the facility repair and replacement fund second Motion by Councilman Hammond, second by Councilman Gregory. Any further discussion, Mr. Strong? No, sir. Ms. Garcia? No, sir. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Council Member Gregory? Aye. Council Member Garcia? Aye. Council Member Strong? Yes, aye. And Mayor Martin? Aye, motion passes 5-0. Council business and committee reports. Mr. Gregory. Um, I have uh, not a lot to report. Um, we had a successful Halloween downtown. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Again, uh, no county meetings. Uh, got one coming up, but uh, nothing to report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Well, all kinds of meetings, most all virtual. Uh, I'll be doing some state and national meetings uh, mostly in the next uh, two weeks, but uh, getting very, very, very busy right now with a lot of things happening in transportation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Uh, no, sir, nothing to report. Thank you. As for me, I met online as usual with our elected officials and public health authorities regarding the COVID situation. You heard that thorough report earlier from Mr. Stornetta. Also attended our Housing Constraints and Opportunity Commission meeting. Uh, I met via Zoom with Travel Paso and some of our hoteliers regarding the Motel 6 conversion. I met with uh, other board members of the Channel County Division of the California the League of California Cities. I also met with the Pass Rebels Chamber of Commerce Board and made a report on city activities to them. I was present this morning at the swearing in of Melissa Martin as our uh, appointed city clerk. Appeared on sound off today on KPRL, attended the Homeless Services Oversight Committee board meeting. And uh, one meeting that I did attend in person, I was invited by our friends in Atascadero to wade into a pond in the Salinas Riverbed to examine the work of beavers in our area. Quite interesting. They would be willing to do such a tour for us up here in Paso Robles if anyone is interested in that. Beyond that, I've been working on some PSAs, some video PSAs from the mayor regarding different subjects in the city, uh, accountability, grants, uh, tips on making public comment, etc. Those can be viewed at PasoMayor.com. That is the mayor's website, which is constructed and maintained by myself at no expense to the taxpayers. Mr. City Manager, any other business to come before the council tonight? No, sir. Very good. Upcoming events. Senior Advisory Commission meeting is Monday, November 9th, 1.30 p.m. Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee meeting Monday, November 9th, 4 p.m. Planning Commission meeting Tuesday, November 10th, 6.30 p.m. And our next City Council regular meeting will be Tuesday, November 17th at 6.30 p.m. The deadline for submitting items for the regular meeting on Tuesday, November 17th is Wednesday, November the 4th. And if there's no further business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. second. I have a motion by Councilman Gregory, second by Councilman Strong. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. We are adjourned. Thank you all for your hard work. Have a pleasant evening.